Welcome to Your Mac Life for a Wednesday, October, no, no, November, November 7th, 2018, show number 1,194. I am your host, Sean King. I'm Melissa King. On tonight's show, we'll talk to our good friend, Jim Dalrymple of The Loop at loopinsight.com. Uh, but we didn't get do, do a show last week, so we'll end up talking about quite a few things. The Apple event that happened two weeks ago in uh, Brooklyn, New York City. We'll also talk about Apple's earnings and the strange thing of the fact that Apple is no longer going to announce the number of devices they sell and the logic behind it. We'll talk about that with Jim. We'll also talk about the new iPad Pros in particular. Jim has got his review in it in hand. We'll talk to him about that. And in our starting point photography segment, we'll talk more street photography in Lisbon, Portugal. Remember, we're going to Lisbon, Portugal, March 23rd to 30th. 2019. You can join us and learn more about taking photographs, taking good photographs while you're on vacation. Uh, if you want, you'll get more information about that a little later on the show. We're also going to be giving away another copy of a uh, uh, city, country, a guidebook from the nice folks at LonelyPlanet.com who are sponsoring our trip to Lisbon. What is Dave saying? He's saying he's coming. Oh, well, of course, at that day. There's so many Daves, so this Dave, of course, <laughs> is coming. So it's a go. Okay, never mind. Sorry, Dave. You finished? Mm -hmm. Okay, just just, just checking. Um, what was I going to say? There's something in my head that I was going to just say right then and there, and I forgot all about it. Ah, uh, oh, happy birthday to Rory. It was his 13th. I can no longer refer to him as the 12-year-old. I must now refer to him as the 13-year-old. He's now a teenager. Did that... Did I mean, you and I, I don't think you and I have talked about this. Did that feel different for you? I mean, your child is now a, an official teenager for whatever hmm. all that means? Well, it's kind of distinctive that he's a teen now. He's is growing it? up. He's taller than me. Well, that's not saying a lot. Uh... <laughs> The cat's on their hind legs are taller than you. <laughs> what were you going to say about his 13-ness? Um, it seems like that's a big... Do you think that's a bigger deal for you or for him? Hmm. Could we have had a chance to talk to him about it? As soon as uh, uh, um, the Thursday, last Thursday, Melissa and I went off to the city. She had a conference to attend. And then uh, Rory's off with his dad for this whole week. His birthday was Sunday. So we haven't had a, any chance to sit down and talk to him about it. But do you think it's... I don't think he. It's hard to tell these days with his. His. Uh, he doesn't reveal very much. He's yeah. just Rory. I don't know. Um, do you think thirteen was a big deal for you when you were a kid? Yeah, it yeah, was. It was it for was, me too. It was. I don't know if I demonstrated that to anybody. I don't know if I told my parents or anyone else. I was excited about it, but I know mentally, being a teenager, I knew it was going to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. I really felt, and you can see where this comes from out of the Jewish tradition the uh, bar and bat mitzvah, that coming of age when you're 13, you really felt different as a teenager than you did as a 12-year-old. Hmm, he's 13, he's in high school, he's getting tall, he's getting smelly, he's getting <laughs> zits. He's thinking about girls and watching things that he shouldn't. Well, yeah, there's, there's that. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how he deals. He's a, he's a wonderful kid. Um, I don't, I don't foresee any problems that you're going to have with Rory as he becomes a, t a teenager. He's a lovely, lovely boy. You know, this is not a kid who's going to get into legal trouble. He's very polite. He's very uh, law abiding. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, He's learning you, Russian. Yes. For, so he can. Where's that coming from? Yeah, I don't know. He wants to be a spy, I guess, when he gets <laughs> older. But he's very, he's fascinated by the Russian language. He is. He is he is uh, using Duolingo to, to learn words, and mm -hmm. he's signed up for the local the, our, our his his high school. Actually, has teaches Russian, which is interesting and odd and cool. They the kids can take French, Spanish, Russian, and I think there's one other. I'm not sure which, but the kids can can. So he's he's uh, him and another one of his friends, another his friends Jackson, are uh, learning Russian together. Yes, which is very cool. Good for them. Um. So, yeah, happy birthday to, to Rory on his 13th birthday. Nope, that wasn't it. Oh, which also which means also that doesn't that mean that the uh, 
Logan Gare is... I was just going to say yeah. to Susan. Oh, Susan says in April. In April, he's 13. 13 in April. Okay. I think Log Logan and Rory would have lots of fun together. Oh, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, what the hell was that thing that I had in my head? That Oh, oh the Tesla. The, the, oh. The, the, she went on a Tesla road... Tres, tip, drive a Tesla SUV. Drive a Tesla SUV. 140000 That's probably the most expensive car you've ever driven, isn't it? $140,000. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. Ferraris in your life or anything else mm, like that? No. No? Okay. So tell folks about... Why did you want to, to test drive the Tesla? The I love a Tesla. What? So, But you didn't... I thought you didn't know anything about Teslas until the drag race that we, that we went to. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but it was... It was Pretty was very. I loved the young man that talked to us Charlie. and educated us very, very well. And good time with him. Lovely rapport with Charlie, and he took us for a drive. And then I, I didn't get to put it into um, auto mode. Yeah, hmm. they they called it um a, sort of like a, a um, what did he call it instead of auto? He called it something else. Right now, it's Advanced, something, advanced cruise, cruise control. control, yeah. But it was very interesting. It was interesting to watch the car shut itself down from any sort of um, advanced cruise control. If you took your hands off the wheel or got a bit distracted, the car would give you a warning. Then it gave Charlie another warning, and then you don't get to do it again <laughs> until after you've parked the car. You get time out. You get put in a timeout. Well, that yeah. is great. Yeah, I thought it was great. Oh, no, and the power to take off from the lights and the silence and the the windshield. <laughs> Just massive, huge... incredible, beautiful windshield. Um, if I was rich, I'd also get the, the power um, charger for at home. Yeah, the car puts you in a timeout. Yeah. It was it was really interesting to um, be in the passenger seat. I, I didn't drive. I had no real interest in, in, in driving it. The first thing I noticed um, getting in was the that windshield. That wind the windshield goes up past your your forehead view all the way back to to see the edge of the windshield. You have to turn around and look behind you. That's how far back it goes on you. You're looking when you look. It's sort of like a, a full sunroof from the the hood all the way back. I did not know that about Teslas. I don't know why I never noticed it before, never thought about it before, but that was really cool. Mm, mm. And for you, it was a problem because you're, you're petite. <clears throat> the windshield is uh, smoked or tinted down to a certain point, but Melissa is below that certain point. So for you, and there's no... Um, Sun visor. Well, there's a little sun, thin sun visor that you can. It's very. The whole thing is very beautifully designed. So you have to pull it and put it across. It's very thin. Mm. But he said there's a mesh that you can put on it. But for me, because I'm, I sit tall, the, uh, the the sun visor thing wouldn't. The 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 tinting um, was fine for me. The other thing about it too was that at six foot three, I'm often have no headroom <clears throat> in a lot of cars, even SUVs. This thing probably had another six inches above my head. Oh, and yeah. And I was sitting up. I sit fairly high in a seat. And even I couldn't, my head wasn't going to go anywhere And the near. same in the back so. seat. There was a, <clears throat> for the passengers, there's like a higher section, in the SUV in any case, higher section of the ceiling there in, in the back. So Sean had lots of headroom in the back. I mean, I love the doors. The door system was just fabulous. I didn't realize that they, they're not gull wing doors no. on the X. They are what they call falcon wing doors. And the difference is a gull wing door opens up completely as one piece. But the falcon wing doors have a hinge in them at the window. So this part hinges back and forth. So it can open up like that, like a, like a trunk, the whole thing. Or will open up hinge so it sort of squishes itself up and then opens up as it gets taller and because of all the sensors around it you can open up the rear doors these that's what, that's what the falcon wings are and it will open up just far enough the sensors won't let it bump into things that are next to it whether it be a car a wall or 
the ceiling. It won't open up all the way to the top if you're in an underground garage and you parked underneath, say, an overhang. It won't pop, just pop open like that, which is great because I've seen lots of people with kids where the kids just open up the rear doors of the cars and it slams into the car next to them, you know, scratching the paint of, of the car next. This wouldn't happen in a Tesla. The, the doors open up by pushing a button and then they electronically open as far as they um, can and stop at that point. You, 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 you can make them go further, but it has, it has to be a conscious effort to make them go for, further. It was really, really interesting. Mm, mm. Um, the, all the technology, not just the, the self-driving technology, which again, we didn't uh, use, we didn't use, our, our test driver guy did for a, a brief period of time. Yeah, you realize how far you can go on a charge. Yeah, you know, more than 400 kilometers. Depending on your battery. But yeah. the, I think the, the lower battery was just under 400 kilometers. Yes, I think it was 375. 373 or something. And there's charge stations everywhere. And the car keeps you um, aware of that. And, you know, it's it's all good. It's all-wheel drive. Um the other thing that we, I, I had never thought, and this is undoubtedly true of all electric cars, that we hadn't thought of or hadn't realized. For us, uh, because we have to travel when we go to Vancouver via a ferry. And in the summertime, you get to the ferry an hour, hour and a half early, and you sit there, and then you baste in your own juices because it's hot. And we have we have no idle spaces here. So you have to turn your car off. You're sitting there, and, blah, blah, blah. and in the wintertime, you freeze to death because you, you're sitting there and you can't idle. So what people will do is they'll turn the car on for brief periods of time to get the AC or the heat going. But this thing is electric. It's yeah. on all the time. You don't have to worry about that. Because I said, oh, you gotta turn the, you got to turn it off, Charlie. He said, but <laughs> so, I don't have to, Melissa. And I went, ah! Oh! That's right. Like, it just struck me. Yeah. It's like, you don't have to turn the car off. He said, you can sit in here. You can listen to your music. You can heat on, heat off, no. whatever. Oh. The biggest issue for me is still that gigantic screen mm -hmm. in the center console. It didn't bother me. The, no, it doesn't bother you. Well, you. You didn't use it that much. But there are. it's good news. There's a lot of controls on the steering wheel. But you still need to look over and down at that screen in order to see that the inputs you're using on the steering wheel have taken. There's no muscle con There's no muscle memory on this kind of stuff. So you still have to look down at that gigantic screen to change temperature, to change the radio, to do those things. Now, Charlie didn't show us the voice control, voice activation of it, which I think would save a lot of that effort of looking down that screen. Because as a motorcycle rider, I don't want you car drivers to ever look anywhere but your windshield. And Tesla, in our cars now, when, when we're driving around in our Jeep, I can reach over and, and turn the radio on or off, turn the volume up, change the, the temperature control, whatever looking away from the windshield. You can, really can't do that in any kind of tester with these giant screens. So that's always going to be a bit of a concern for me because as a motorcyclist, you're a lot more susceptible to the danger of um, distracted driving. And that screen seems to me to increase distracted driving and not decrease it. Perhaps. I think distracted driving is an issue now, huge. Yep. But I mean, you can you can set that car so everything is set for you. You've yeah. got your temperature that you like. This look, you got your music that everything is already the seat set. Will move, back and you'll and get forward. in, and it's set for Melissa. So everything is exactly the same. Or if not, you touch, and it will it will adjust everything. And then you have your voice activation, and then your where you're going is on just to the left of the steering wheel if you if you need to follow directions. On the screen, yeah. um, so I pretty don't know. cool. Pretty cool. It was fun. It was uh, we're not in the market for it. We're not gonna buy one, but it was interesting to get a demonstration mm. of the technology. Later on the show in our starting point photography segment, we're gonna talk more about street photography in Lisbon. We're going to Lisbon next March twenty third to thirtieth for the starting point photography workshop. We'll talk more about that later in the show. But up next we're gonna to talk to our good friend Jim Downpl of the Loop at loopinsight.com. This is your Mac Life.
Welcome back, folks. Thank you guys very much for joining me here this Wednesday evening. As always, we've got a good friend, Jim Down for The Loop at loopinsight.com on the phone with me. Jim, how you doing? I was just saying, you just cut off one of my favorite songs. <laughs> Sorry. I was, I, was, I was in the backyard. I had my AirPods in, <laughs> and I'm jamming out to air guitar to, to uh, Fire Woman from oh, The Cult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A great song. Uh, yeah, just um, and the it, it it was in the breakdown, and the chorus was just about to kick back in, and then you call, and the music cuts off, and I'm thinking, son of a bitch, you know. Oh, so, I'm sorry. That's all right. I'll you'll I'll take out my pound of flesh in the next half hour. I'm sure you will. Yeah, no kidding. First up, how was Grandma's birthday? Grandma's birthday was so awesome. Cool, man. <laughs> uh, I took her to. Um, my, my grandma, she loves fish. I mean, being from Nova Scotia, but she spends the winters down in Tampa. Yeah. So I went to Tampa and, um, uh, she, she doesn't, she spends all her, her winter there, but you know, she doesn't often go out and treat herself. So I treated her to, um, three different big fish lobster meals. I was, I was choking and gagging. <laughs> Cause you don't like lobster. It's weird. I, I don't like any fish. So any fish. I, I just, I just treat her to, uh, treated her to whatever she wanted. And my parents met me there. So it was, you know, it was a great birthday for her. Fantastic. So, and I, you know, I, since I've known her all my life, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't, I didn't realize until people started bringing it up. Like, wow, she doesn't look 90. Yeah. She doesn't. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I looked at the picture that I posted and said, "Wow, you're right. She yeah, doesn't. Yeah, maybe maybe that's why I look so good." Yeah, well, of course, it's got to be those good jeans. Yeah. Must be because your mom and dad are good-looking people too. Well, you know, yeah. What runs in? I mean, I outdo them all, obviously. <laughs> but you know. so you missed the the Apple event in person because you were there at uh, Grandma's in Tampa Bay. Did, so you watched it online, I'm sure, like the rest of us. Did you did. notice, like I did, that Tim Cook seemed more energized being in Brooklyn than he was when he does things in California? Um, I think Tim is, is usually always energized. Um, I don't know if he was more energized. I don't think I really noticed that. But I noticed, um, I noticed that the crowd felt more energized, too. That was, was because, though, a lot of the crowd were um, weren't pressed. They were... Apple employees and guests and that kind of stuff. So that's why well, there was so much cheering. The crowd was kind of weird to me because it was overwhelming cheering. Yes, yes. And and it was, and I know because I'm usually there, the press are not cheering and clapping. Yeah. I mean, most of us are either taking notes or we're sitting there. We clap when Tim comes out. We clap when Tim leaves. Yeah. And, and just out of respect, I guess, but... The rest of the time, yeah, we're, we're not, we're not clapping. That's right. So, so all of the thing that you see there, and it's not analysts, I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it just seemed, 
it seemed odd. I like the vibe of that particular event. It did seem it had more energy to it, whether it was odd or not. I, I, I enjoyed that, if only because it reminded me so much of the Macworld Expo keynote that Steve Jobs did, where they could get quite raucous. Because, again, at least half the audience weren't, weren't media. They were Expo showgoers. As, as media, we'll, we'll, we'll clap politely. We'll give you a golf clap. But we're not going to, in theory, anyway, yell and, and cheer and, and scream right. for, for a, a Jobs or, or Cook. Except when they announced that iTunes was coming to Canada, then I cheered. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> Finally, you bastards! <laughs> the, uh, it was quite ex- expected. We kind of <coughs> knew that Apple was going to announce the, the iPad, the new iPads. The thing that surprised me the most was Apple gave absolutely zero notice or indication as to why they sent out those different logos. Did you notice that? Did you yeah, think that well, was odd? Maybe it was just a thing, you know. But at least acknowledge the fact that they did this. And see, because we all just assumed they were going to show off. This is how these artists created this using the new iPad and the new Apple Pencil. No, I, see, they don't need to acknowledge it because they sent them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? They knew. <laughs> they knew. They, you know, they don't need to explain why. I mean, they just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think one of the best things uh, that sort of if brought a virtual tear to my eye was Apple announced that they had passed 100 million active Mac users, which yeah. made me, even here in the privacy of my own home here in Gibson, go, yay! If yeah. only because us old-timers remember we were cheering on 5 million active Mac users. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That That is true. So. And and it's it's pretty amazing when you look back, and we've discussed this before, uh, where Apple would have a good quarter and sell like three hundred thousand Macs. <laughs> That's right. And you know, like Wall Street was astounded. Yeah, and we yeah. were, like, Ooh, damn, wow, three hundred thousand <laughs> You know, now they're selling um, in the range of probably three point five to five million a quarter. Yeah, a quarter, depending depend, yeah. depending on the quarter. Yeah. And there, then they were selling a few hundred thousand. So. Um, you know, I, I think that, I think despite the fact that some people believe that Apple is doing away with the Mac, the Mac is still very important yep. to, uh, to them, to their, uh, to their customers. And, you know, it, it's going to continue that way for, for the time being. I think as long as Apple continues to sell in the, the numbers that Apple is selling in, um, Macintosh wise, that 3.5, 5 million per quarter, there's no, and as, as long as development costs don't outweigh whatever profit they're getting out of those things, I think Apple's going to continue. There's no reason why Apple wouldn't continue with the Mac. The Mac is always going to have that place, at least in the foreseeable future, the next 10, 20 years. This is that the Steve Jobs truck versus car analogy. That being said, and I know you've got one in hand. It feels like from the reviews I read about the uh, the new 12.9 inch iPad Pro, this thing is pretty powerful. This thing seems to be pretty incredible, and it sounds like people are saying it's the software that's holding it back. Give us your initial impressions of the the new iPad Pro. Well, for, first off, I think uh, what people really have to understand about the iPad Pro and what really got me was that the Comparing to the old versions, the 10.5-inch uh, iPad Pro got bigger. It's bigger in, in that it's now all screen, yes. but same physical size, yep. right? So that is actually looks bigger to you. But the 12.9-inch got smaller. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, somebody asked me today, I posted just a, a tweet and said, you know, I'm loving this 12.9-inch uh, iPad Pro. Yeah, I I love the previous one too, but it was kind of big. It was kind of cumbersome, yeah. and I never took it anywhere. I would use that at home only, so it was more like a computer. My ten point five inch, I took every. I took that to Tampa. Yeah, yeah. My, my but the person that that tweeted me today, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, but they said I use a ten point five inch for everything. What's the footprint of the 12.9? Yeah. And I, I, what a great question. And yeah, it actually seems smaller, but uh, 
huge screen. You know, and, and and that's what you get with the twelve point nine. Now, you obviously the power of that thing is just insane, which I think explains a lot why Apple can't do much more with the Mac these days, because Intel can't keep up. Mm. You know, so when people look at the power of the Mac, it's not that the power is not there uh, to be had, because Apple has proven that it is there to be had in the iPad. But the power is not there to be had with Intel. I noticed in at the Gruber during the event that Apple didn't really mention Intel at all. Uh, a lot of folks are going to be looking at conspiracy theories on that as to why Apple didn't. Uh, I think Gruber's point was the best one. It was, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything nice. Don't say well, any, any, anything at all. Yeah, and that could very well be it. I mean. What good things can you honestly say about Intel's development right now? Yeah. I, I mean, it's they seem to have hit a brick wall. And while they're hitting a brick wall, uh, Apple's forging ahead. Apple's Apple's developing seven nanometer chips now. Yeah. They have built billions of transistors on there. I mean, this thing is powerful as hell. So yeah, yeah. I I, I just I don't know I don't know what the future holds for Apple and Intel but when Apple can do what it's doing on these chips oh boy I think that this is doesn't this point to the obvious solution in let's say two to five years where Apple will have its own chips and its own laptops I mean that just seems to be the obvious. Uh, logical extension of where Apple is going with the A12 Bionic, A12X Bionic, A13, whatever they're, they're coming out with. That's got to be where Apple's heading. It's got to be. You would think so. You really would. I mean, uh, when when you look at everything that that Apple has done just in their chip manufacturing, I mean, it's pretty spectacular. It's often been said that Apple has got some of the best chip designers in Silicon Valley. Um, that this is, you know, they they they're beating AMD, they're beating Intel, they're beating everyone when it comes to designing chips. They've been amassing this talent for at least the last five years, and it's really starting to to, to show off. That being said, the power of the iPad Pro is it wasted on an iPad? In other words, is it too powerful for what we perceive an iPad is used for? Well, here's in 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 writing this review of the the, the iPad Pro, the new one. I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to say this very thing. And if you talk to people that use an iPad Pro all the time, they would say, no, it's not wasted. This is exactly what I've been waiting for. So another uh, fellow texted me today and said, well, if the iPad Pro could only do logic and plugins, then I'd be very happy. Yeah. Now for me, and he, he said later on, as we were discussing on Twitter, I said, I don't use my iPad very much for music production because I have a powerful Mac sitting right beside me, you know, right beside my guitar and everything else. So why would I use the iPad? Yep, yep. Um, and, and that goes back, I think to uh, uh, maybe my age or my experience level in using a Mac. Somebody new, you know, a 20 year old may look at the iPad and say, hell yes, bring that on. I don't yep. need a Mac. Yep. You know, so, for those people, uh, think now that they have uh, Photoshop on an iPad. Yes. They, you know, um, Illustrator. They have all of these apps. They have Pixelmator Pro. They have, uh, which I actually prefer, uh, they have Acorn. They have, you know, all of these wonderful, great, powerful apps that they can do things on. And, you know, for music, there's... There's certainly GarageBand and there's, uh, you know, some other apps that you can use there too. But, I mean, 
that's that's a lot of things that you can do and a lot of power that you need in order to run that stuff. So is it wasted? I don't think so. I, I think that Apple's in the, they seem to be, to me, on the cusp of what they originally dreamed of with the iPad. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't think that that's a, a laptop replacement. Everybody seems to be trying to make the iPad a laptop replacement. I think it's its own platform on its own. Yes. You know, it, it's not a replacement for something. It's not a trade-off for something. I think they envisioned the iPad to be um, as, as something as compelling as a PC. And I think with the power of the iPad and with the apps that continue to come, we're getting pretty close to, I think, what they envisioned. There's no reason to to believe that the iPad is solely for one kind of user or one kind uh-huh. of use. It's, no way. Apple is developing products that, hey, whatever your use case is, we're trying to fill a niche for you. We're trying to let you know that we've got a bunch of different things for you. I just posted up on The Loop uh, a couple hours ago, Austin Mann's review of the iPad Pro. Austin Mann... Yeah. Um, took the iPad Pro with him to Iceland, not to shoot photos, but to do something that when you mentioned musicians and using Logic, it feels like this is more of a use case for a photographer than it would be for a musician. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't feel like musicians need to get a song done right now. Like right, I gotta, I finish, The song has to be finished in half an hour. Whereas you know, the photographers but, often have to do that on the on the road, in the car. They've got to get these photos posted up to their website or posted to their job or things like right. that. And the iPad Pro now with Lightroom, Austin Mann is saying this is an, an amazing tool for that particular job. So here's the thing, though, with, with musicians, and this happens to me a lot. And I talked to uh, Brett Michaels. I don't know if you know him from Poison. Yeah, I recognize um, the name, the dude. Yeah. Okay, dude, wait, well, wait, wait a name and, drop, you douche. And, Jesus. No, no, I'm trying to explain to you. <laughs> and and uh, Sully Erna from Godsmack. Yeah. And both of them said that they used to carry cassette recorders around with them yeah. in the car everywhere yeah. so that they could hum the song. And I did that uh, uh, um, with... You know those little. Remember those little Olympus recorders? Oh yeah. That that yeah. The little pocket recorders. Yep. I used to do that with one of those. I would hum a riff, and then go back when I get back home because if I don't do that within seconds of figuring it out in my head, I'll lose it. Yeah. So that is where the iPad comes into play for a lot of musicians. They're sitting on a tour bus. They're sitting. Yep. Um, you know, at home or whatever, they just quickly, you know, turn on the iPad and record and just play the riff. Yeah. Because, as you know, as a guitar player, I know when you're doing that a lot of the times, your guitar is sitting right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you just press record, record the riff, save it, and then you're done. So this, it, it is almost like that immediate thing. You need that immediacy to be able to record and to do what you want to do now Mm -hmm. if the ipad is cumbersome and not powerful enough to be able to handle that then you know you lost what could be for those guys not me could be a million dollar hit yeah you know and that's i I, so photographers musicians everybody everybody that that wants to create something i mean apple focuses a lot on and rightfully so um, you know, image editing and things like that. But there are other uses where this power really comes in handy. The uh, Dave D in the RC chat room makes an interesting point. He says, so the problem with using the AXS chips in the Mac is that it would kill both bootcamp parallels and VMware on the Mac. They all rely on Intel architecture. I can guarantee you Apple doesn't give a rat's ass about that. They could not well, care less if their switch to some other chip kills Windows on the Macintosh. That being said, I'd be willing to bet that Apple will continue with at least one machine that will stay Intel if they move to their own chips. They'll have at least one machine that will continue to be an Intel machine. See, moving is always dangerous. Yes. Uh, because 
let's say that Apple moved and none of the, the code that people are writing, which I don't believe, none of the code that people are writing is compatible with this new chip. Yeah. Um, and they have to start over. That is, the, oh boy, that's risky business right mm -hmm. there. Yep. So, you know, killing off something like, like Parallels or, yeah, Apple could care less about them or that whole business. They, they just don't care. But if they can say to developers, we figured out a way. Remember when they switched to uh, Mac OS X, they had the classic mode yep. where classic apps would still run. If yep. they could figure out a way to do that, and the Intel apps would still run them. Oh, by the way, you only need to change, you know, 5% of your code in order to make it work because it's already, you know, in this realm of working on iOS anyway. Um, then, you know, maybe then they have a chance, but they risk losing developers like uh, you know, Pro Tools or maybe even Adobe on the Mac or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that would, that would hold them back. Arkstein says, Sean, ask Jim if he thinks that transitions aren't a thing anymore. The question about transition and drawbacks is the first thing that comes to mind, but the future of Apple products and Apple users aren't tied down anymore. iOS upgrades and iPhone models and Apple Watch and Apple TVs put that in the grave long ago. No, that's absolutely true. Yeah. It did, yeah. except on the desktop. Yes. I think the desktop is still... Because of the software, Apple doesn't control the software on the Mac like it does on iOS. So um, uh, for a, a lot of those companies, they may say, we're, we're fine not moving. You know, we're not going to transition every 10 years mm -hmm. or so for, for Apple or, or 15 years. You know, we're not going to do that. And this is just too much work for us and we're not going to do it because, you know, let's face it, even some of the biggest software developers – aren't doing the best these days. So they might not want to do that. Yeah. That is that is a real danger. Now, the fact that Apple's computers could be a hundred times faster or, you know, whatever they could make them, um, I think that is actually a secondary thing to people not being able to get the apps that they want because yeah. the apps make the uh, the device, whatever it is. And so, so your dangerous. I assume your review of the uh, iPad Pro will be up uh, sometime this week? Uh, probably first and next. All right, good. Let's it's move already on. Wednesday. I'm tired. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. Uh, let's move on to the, the, uh, the new MacBook Air, the, uh, the Retina MacBook Air, yeah. which is what we were all looking for. Is this something that was of interest to you? Uh, I'm like you, like me. I'm also a, a big desktop screen kind of guy. It's yeah. hard for me personally to, to, if I had the money, and I don't, if I had the money to buy either an iP iPad Pro 12 inch, 12.9 inch, or the new MacBook Air, I would have a hard time choosing. Would you? Uh, well, I don't have a, a, a MacBook Air, so, uh, but I can assume what it looks and feels like. Yep. Uh, the thing with the, the Air, and I think it's always been a thing with the Air, is that it's for a very specific group of people, and that group of people loves it to death. Yes. And so if, if you talk to one of those groups and I'm, I'm talking like uh, a, a college student or a, a executive at a company uh, somebody that travels a lot and they want a mac instead of an ipad there is no replacement you could give them for a macbook air yeah there is nothing you can do to make that computer uh, go away out of their uh, uh their use so I mean, Apple has tried the 13 inch. They've yep. tried all kinds of different things and people still want a MacBook air. Yeah, they, they so, do. So, um, I, I loved, I had a MacBook air. I used an 11 inch that I used for a long time and I could actually, I could run pro tools on that. Mm -hmm. And that was probably three or four years ago, you know? So it was a very powerful system even then because, yep. you know, pro tools, takes up a lot of cycles. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I, I don't think that the MacBook Air is a wasted product on anybody because the people that want it want that form factor. They want the lightness. They don't need the, uh, uh, you know, a lot of peripherals that they're using it on the go and they want to go. And that's what they want to take. So, yeah, it's an interesting little uh, uh, little machine for people. I I have a, I had a, a a MacBook Air as well. I broke the screen on it, and now it's just sitting useless next to me. I don't travel anymore, so I don't really need a right. the full power of a laptop anymore in the airport or in the hotel or those kinds of things. Which is why I'm thinking that the, my next purchase from Apple would be the the iPad Pro. But yeah, you're right. The Air does fill a certain niche, very much like the, the Mac mini. And I will t- I'll be the first person to admit I was dead wrong when I said Apple, the, the, the Mac mini was dead. Were you surprised by how much the mini was upgraded? I mean, this is a whole new machine. Yeah. Then again, after four years, it certainly should have been. Well, I mean, yeah, the, the mini was received a, a, a huge upgrade and good for the people that wanted that upgrade. I'm um, certainly glad that apple did it for them um but i still stand by what i said before i really don't care yep that's right i, um, I remember watching watching the video and 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 uh, tim cook said said the the, the, the macbook the the mac mini is now five times faster i was like is that all you've been working on this for four years you're getting five times faster come on well I think the 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 thing is they haven't been working on it. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, they just they just saw okay. Well, let's throw the new processor in there, and <laughs> you know, um, whatever. What whatever and, exactly? And, and and people will will buy it. The people that are going to buy the Air will not, or I'm sorry, buy the Mini, will not buy anything else because the Mini suits their purpose and. And even though I said in my write-up about the event last week, somebody uh, pinged me on Twitter and said, it's a great machine for those of us who have the uh, peripherals and the screen and just want um, that cheaper computer. And they're mm-hmm. absolutely right. They, I, I mean, I have no argument for anybody that says that they love the Mini. Mm-hmm. I really don't. And I'm not trying to argue with anybody that says that they love the Mini. I just, it's if some if somebody gave me a mini, walked up and said, "Here you go. Here's a mini and a nice uh, display to go with it." I wouldn't turn them down. Yeah, it's a yeah. great computer. But if they said, "Do you want a mini or like a donkey?" I'd probably choose the donkey <laughs> because you know I already have the computer, <laughs> but I don't have a donkey. So well, well, you know. and, and the other problem is that the price has increased so much. That is no longer an entry level machine. It's not the machine that you would have. have I, I remember when the Mini first came out, I, I would recommend it to Windows users who wanted to get into the Macintosh but didn't want to. They've already got a keyboard, they've already got a mouse, they've already got a, a, a screen. They don't need. They don't want to buy all that stuff with, with an iMac. So I said, well, look at this Mac Mini thing. You can run Windows on it. It's it's under five hundred dollars. Here's here's a good machine for you to test out. That is no longer the the case. This is now a full blown machine, but without peripherals, including a screen. So I don't know if I could recommend it in that same way anymore. Well, and it, that's excuse me. That's uh, it's. I, I think it's still a recommended item based on you know a new user or um, you know somebody like that because it, it. I think it's still the cheapest Mac. Yeah. You know, so it, it's going to be something that uh, that people will enjoy using if they're coming over, and they do have all of those perks. No. Now, uh, how much is the Mac Mini? Uh, it starts, I think it starts at eight hundred dollars. All right, well, that's a bit more than what it was. Yeah, I well, mean, when when it was introduced, I think when it was in, when it was introduced, it was under five hundred. I want to say yeah, three ninety nine or four ninety nine. No, I think it was four ninety nine. Four ninety nine. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because Jobs would want to make sure he got that extra. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it's it's yeah. it's no longer a, a, a nice cheap little little um, uh, desktop server or those kinds of things. Well, it's it's yeah. It starts. At, I just checked the Apple's website. It starts at eight eight hundred bucks. 
No, I think it still is that cheap server, though. Yeah. I mean, it's not as cheap. I mean, if all you want is a media server, which is what a lot of people do with it, uh, let's let's be honest, yep. they use it to to put all their content on and run that to Apple TV and and uh, you know places throughout their house. Yep. So, uh, but eight hundred bucks, you know, that may be more than than some people are willing to spend. But it is, and yes, five times over four years, I get it, but. It is powerful, and it does have some, you know, some great options for ports and things like that. So, um, I still think it's it's going to be a seller for them. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, let's move on to Apple's event. Uh, sorry, Apple's yeah. uh, earn, earning report last week. Uh, uh, iPhone revenue jumped twenty nine percent. Apple making it sold I think near nearly five million Macintoshes. 14 million yeah. iPads. They're just incredible, as usual, eight straight quarters wasn't, of growth. Wasn't the iPad number lower than that? The the, the iPad number? I got I to look it up. Anyway, they sold. Someone had, I, I think, think the, the only thing that was down was the iPad. iPad, yeah. But last, even then, last, they're last still quarter. selling millions upon millions of these things. Yeah, yeah they are quarter. selling millions. Yeah, I think that was down uh, quite a bit from from this time last year the iphones were up the macs were up ipads were down the, um but i i don't think they'll be down for long they won't be down next quarter as as uh, ben bajaran said uh, several times that there is no longer a tablet market there's a ipad market that's it everyone that, else is true. just dead and gone if you want a tablet you're generally going to buy an ipad if you want a multi-purpose tablet, you want just a, a, a reading tablet, the Kindle is still hands down the best device for that kind of thing. But for the most part, right. if you want something to play games on and watch videos and travel, it's the iPad. Well, but, you either buy the iPad or you buy an Etch-a-Sketch. That's right. I mean, you know, obviously the price value is better on the Etch-a-Sketch, but... <laughs> And you can play Hangman, I'm sure. I'm sure you can. You know, yeah. I'm, you know but... But the thing that got so much attention, and interestingly enough, was the fact that Apple has said they will no longer reveal how many iPhones, Macs, and uh, what else? Uh, Apple, uh, Any iPads. Device. Any device. They're, they're not going to do break things out unit sales price anymore. My first inclination on this was, why would they do that? This sounds suspicious. This sounds odd. Luckily, I don't write hot takes, so luckily I didn't sound like an idiot like so many other people did <laughs> when they wrote their personal hot takes. All I love how the Mac media suddenly become stock analysts whenever this kind of stuff happens. I know why this yeah. happened, and this is a bad thing because of the, the stock market yeah. itself hammered Apple over yes. this issue, even though Apple is the only major tech company that did this. Yes. All Apple is doing true. is falling in line with what everyone else did, and yet they're the one who they're the ones who get hammered by this. Do you understand why yeah. Apple's doing this and do you agree with their their reasoning? I look, I I have said on on this show many times that any company, Apple, Samsung, Best Buy, McDonald's, I don't care, that makes and reports billions of dollars in profit they that's not a failure yep. i don't care how, right. how many billions they report that is not a failure yep. and what what people i think what investors the average investor needs to understand is that apple has a responsibility to continue making money that's it that is their responsibility they don't need to break down how many of this and that and i can't wait for the next analyst call because that's what they're going to ask oh, absolutely, and they know yeah. that they're not going to tell them yep. but they're also you know brain dead that they're going to ask anyway it's just like remember charlie wolf for years yep. um hey steve can you can you tell us <laughs> how, how, how many how many retail stores are going to open this year no no okay thanks thanks <laughs> thanks, bye -bye. thanks steve <laughs> No, Charlie, we're not going to tell That's you. Right. Okay, yeah. thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> you know, and it was just hilarious. Every single quarter, yep. Charlie would ask the same question. They never told him. And and Charlie is a very smart guy, but I don't mean I'm not making fun of Charlie. He was he is a very smart guy. But his his phone calls with Steve were just I mean, you can put those on a comedy show. Yeah, no kidding. 
Um, but, you know, people are going to ask this, and Apple is not going to answer it. But they're going to, as long as they keep making profit and keep putting out new devices, I mean, Apple has already taken steps to limit what their competition knows about their sales. So, for instance, they don't break down which iPhone units sell the most. Yes. They don't break down which Mac units because then the, the competition could target those areas against them. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they don't, they don't do that. So, you know, uh, I, I could really care less if, would I like to know? Sure. Sure. I would like to know. I would like to even more detail than what we get now. I would like to know how the iPhone max at 10 S max did. I would like to know how it did compared to the, to the S. Um, I would like to know how many older phones are still being sold. I would like to know all of that because I think it's fascinating information to have, but Apple does not have to disclose that type of information to us. And in fact, they don't have to disclose any information besides, you know, here's, here's the diluted share price. Here's, you know, what was international sales. Here's what we did in revenue. Here were expenses. And here's what we ended up with profit, which is more money than you will ever see in your entire (laughs) fucking life. So I I think Apple was very clear. If you read between the lines, I think Apple was very clear in their description of this. They basically said, this is me translating Apple CFO, Lucas Maestra. I think I'm saying his name wrong. Lucas Maestra. Um, uh, He basically said, look, We've been doing this for you guys out of the kindness of our hearts. We didn't have to do it. No one else does it. We thought you might be interested in it. But you all keep hammering us on this stupidity. We keep, as you said, we keep making billions of dollars over here. But all you morons want to focus on is whether we've sold 12 more iPhones and iPads than we did last quarter. So guess what? Screw you. We're not telling you that anymore. Yeah. What you're going to now get is these big picture things, and we're not going to give you the breakdown of this like our competitors don't do. We're going to let you guys hang there, and all you can report now is whether we made a million billion dollars or a trillion billion dollars. That's it. Screw you. Well, and and look at, I I have never once, as much as I've hit on Samsung, uh, every chance I get for being the thieving bastards that they are. (laughs) I have never once said that they were not successful in being thieving bastards. That's right. And they are. <laughs> they absolutely are. They make billions of dollars. You can never say that that is not a success. Yep. Uh, and, and when you have billions of dollars in profit. And Apple's fiduciary responsibilities, Tim Cook's responsibilities, and Luca's responsibilities are to make sure – that the company is maximizing every single dollar that they have. Yep. And over the years, starting with Steve, they have decided to take a stand with the environment, um, with privacy. And there is no doubt, and don't kid yourself about how much that stuff costs, because it costs them a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. To, to make all of their product. I mean, they, they developed a new uh, process to make the max out of aluminum shavings that are on the floor of the factory. Yeah. I mean, come on. Aluminum shavings. Apple invented, really? Apple invented a new metal. All right. I mean, that's, that's what it is. They invented a new yeah. metal alloy. I mean, are you kidding me? Who does this? And, and, that's what they're going to make their next car out of. Yep. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, it's it's things like Apple being, I, they have their own metallurgists. Yeah, yeah. They have the, the uh, comprehension as a company to say, how are we going to be more environmentally friendly at the same time maximizing the profits that, we can deliver back to investors. What more does Wall Street need to know than that? Yep. I mean, how many metals has Dell invented? No, okay. How many processes 
to uh, uh, make a, a, a single form a computer has HP invented. And it, I, H, I, I get HP is a, a historic company and they've done a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not doing so much now. Yep. You know, well, I, I just think that Apple is, uh, they're, they're firing on all cylinders right now. We'll let you go on this last note, uh, going back to the actual Apple what event. What if I don't want to go? <laughs> we can find something else to talk about, not a problem. <laughs> the, 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 the only discordant note I heard out of the Apple event was when they had the uh, young lady uh, come on to sing. I forgot, Lana Del Rey? Lana Del Rey. This is how old I am. I have no idea who she is. And it, it made me sad when they announced her, and I was like, huh? I don't know who she is. But the fact that they wouldn't let her say the name of her album, and she said this on stage that she's not she yes. was told she's not allowed to say the name of her album. That to right. me further cements my belief that Apple is not going to make our rated content for whatever Apple TV subscription service shows they are going to put on in the next six months to two years. Okay, so when I start talking, we're going to be like 30 minutes. All right. All right. So I posted this on Twitter uh, that it seemed weird to me that Apple would preach the whole time yep. about how much they are for creatives. But the singer they chose couldn't say the name of yep. her album. Yep. A lot of people liked it. A lot of people commented on it. Uh, some agreed with me, some disagreed with me. There was one person who said Apple just didn't want her to swear because it's on, uh, you know, a broadcast yep. around the world and you don't know who's watching. And Lana Del Rey actually liked that post. Yes. So she was aware of the post that I made. Yep. Obviously, uh, Apple was too. But I still found it weird because, you know, what what's next? And, I mean, is Apple going to show some of the famous paintings from around the world but not show Van Gogh because he cut off his ear and that was violent? Yep. Um, uh, you know, you can't swear, but if this is per part of creativity and part of the, I, I don't know, yep. find a different artist. Exactly. Somebody that has an album that, you know. But I really, I enjoy Lana Del Rey's music. Yeah. I really do. I, I think she's very talented. I I, I think that the, the music that she played at the uh, event was wonderful. Uh, I have no issue with her at all. Yep, none. I and I had I don't really have an issue with Apple. I only have questions. Yeah, that's right. I, th this doesn't make any sense to me. You know so. Um, so no classic paintings with naked angels and no, um, music with swear words. Um, I, I'm, I'm not getting how you're all for the creatives, you know, and let me be, the was, let me be the first I, I one. I was a little bit upset about it. Let me be the first one to say her new album is called Norman fucking Rockwell. Okay. Be, right. be a grown yeah. up. Apple, if nothing else, they certainly could have bleeped it afterwards. It was a live show. No telling what might have happened in a live show. As those folks who watched Beto O'Rourke in, in Texas last night, they could have easily, because they have edited post, they have edited videos they, they posted on the website in the past, so it's not like they don't know how to do this. By telling her she can't say the name of her own damn album, that just seems so so uh, 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 puritanical of them. And like yeah. I said, I think that is a signal that Apple is not going to have anything above a PG rating. We just saw the news story today that there was a rapper who is uh, streaming his uh, documentary movie that he shot for Apple because Apple won't post it. Apple won't say why they won't post it, but it's pretty obvious. He's a rapper. So that's why they're not, not doing this stuff. All of their content that they're creating, that you read about, that uh, Jennifer Aniston's involved in, and this person involved in, et cetera, et cetera, 
all that content is going to be G-rated, at the most PG-rated. I think that's cowardly of Apple to do it that way. Well, I've, I've said before, and we've talked, that what, personally, what I expect from Apple, I think I, think I just saw a UFO. <laughs> You're under a bridge. How do you see UFOs under a bridge? I peeked through. Oh, okay. There's a, there's a, one of those little grates in the middle of the bridge. Mm, mm, I, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, I, we, we've talked many times before about the future of Apple's video content. Yep. And what, what I want from them is the next biggest hit. You know, the next whatever netflix has done or hulu has done or amazon has done make that i want you to make that i want apple to become so dominant in video that that's what i want to watch but right now if you if you say this is what apple is coming out with then okay you know uh, sure i'll i'll add it to my list of things to watch but like uh there's a show on I think it's HBO called Ray Donovan. Yeah. Yeah. And I love Ray Donovan. And whenever I'm having a bad day, I turn on Ray Donovan because he's having a worse day. Like people are yeah, getting really. murdered and shot and you know. Uh so I I love that that show, but there are other shows like it. You know, so many of these networks or content providers are making such quality content. I will watch that over, say, you know, I don't know, Law and Order or yep. whatever. Yep. But if it's just a show that I add to Law and Order and NCIS, I could I could care less if I ever see those again. You know, what what are you opening? You opening some whiskey or what? I, I wish no. Sorry, it's my thermos of cold water. Why do you have a thermos of cold water? Because I'm married and my wife wants to drink more water. Huh? Because she's concerned about my health. Huh. <laughs> good thing nobody's good, good thing nobody's concerned about my health. <laughs> well, we all are. Now come on. Well, I'm 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 drinking my beer. There you go. It's got it's 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 made out of water. Yeah, it's just that's right. It's I, I want Apple to make the best content that's available with whatever right. people they can they can convince to to come on board. And then just get out of the way. Let the creatives be creative. Uh, TV has shown that it, it can handle everything from G-rated car- content to R-rated content, whether that be on right. regular CBS, NBC type stuff, or whether it be on HBO. Apple should just, cre- if they're going to be involved in this, and you're going to hire these people, hire them and then get the hell out of their way, not nickel and dime right. them and, and micromanage no. them in this kind of way. No, I don't think, honestly... I do not think Apple's nickel and diamond. I really don't. That's not the issue. Sorry, I, mean, I, I should have said micromanaging. I'm sure they're paying them stupid yeah. amounts of money. Well, and I, I think that they would pay stupid amounts of money to have uh, the shows produced. Yes. I, I think that I, I don't think that any of those things are, are going to come down to money. I'm sure that they're going to be well done. Um, but it's the content. It's the, I, I mean, I want the original iTunes store when it took off and people just went, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can buy that right now and listen to it. Wow. <laughs> I you know, crack I want, as we called it. Yeah. I want that show where I can get it and I just look at it and say, wow, this is incredible. Yeah. The, the next phenom show. And I, I don't think that. Apple will be able to do it yep. based on what we've seen. But we'll we'll have to wait and see. Yep, time will tell. Folks have been talking to Jim Downpour of the Loop at loopinsight.com. He has his own podcast available up there on the iTunes store. It's called the Dalrymple Report. You can subscribe to it via iTunes. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Sean. Talk to you next week. Bye. Yep.
Folks, as always, if you have any comments about anything uh, we're talking about, we'd love to get emails from you guys. You can send us emails to sean at yourmaclifeshow.com or you can send emails to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com. If you want something on this show, on air is the best address, if only because that's the, the email address I check while I, while the show is live. So live on air at yourmaclifeshow.com. When we come back, we'll have our starting point photography segment. Thanks very much for joining us. This is Your Mac Life. Hello, my name is Melissa King. I'm Your Mac Life's official Spokes Australian. As Sean begins his 25th year of broadcasting on the internet, he has asked me to say a few words to you all. Send money. What? Why not? More? Okay. When you listen to Your Mac Life, you'll notice there are no ads, no commercial breaks, No five-minute ad reads products you've already bought or have no interest in buying. That's because Your Mac Life is entirely listener-supported. And not even listener-supported via a paywall or a subscription service. It's simple. If you like Your Mac Life, you can pay for it. If you don't want to pay for it, you don't have to. You can still listen. But we'd really like it if you did. On the Your Mac Life homepage at yourmaclifeshow.com, on the top left, there is a subscribe to YML box. You can send any amount you'd like each month automatically from your credit card or PayPal account. It's set for $2, $5, $10 or $15, but you can set it for any amount by clicking the Donate button. The best part is you'll barely notice it. It's $2, but it makes a huge difference to us here at Your Mac Life. It means we can pay for website hosting, internet access, new computers and software to run the show on, and so much more. So, if you like Your Mac Life, please subscribe. $2 will make a tiny dent in your wallet, but when enough people subscribe, it makes a huge difference to Your Mac Life. I'm Melissa King. Thank you. Welcome back, folks. Thanks very much for joining us here on the show. This is uh, Your Mac Life, and this is the Starting Point Photography segment for Wednesday, November the 7th, 2018. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, We talked, well, two weeks ago on the show about street photography. And we talked in the general idea of what street photography is and some of the tips and techniques you can use for street photography. This came up because uh, Melissa was asking about this because this is something that we're going to be doing a fair amount of when we are in uh, Lisbon. It is a city. It is an urban environment. There is a lot of uh, places that we'll go when we're in Lisbon next March <coughs> that are just wandering around the city looking at that particular city and trying to capture whatever you see, whatever you find attractive or interesting or picturesque in the city. And the, one of the things I love about street photography, especially with groups, is how we can all be in the same place but see completely different things. It's really neat. I, I've not been on a lot of photo walks with people. And then uh, when they post their photos afterwards, you, you come back and you um, look at their stuff and you go, I was right there. I did not see that thing that you took this beautiful image of. So I really love, it's kind of like looking through someone else's eyes um, when you do street photography in a, with a group of people. Melissa found this great uh, website on uh, uh, Google Street View, or sorry, Google Street Photography Lisbon. It's a whole bunch of Lisbon shots, and I'll uh, uh, create a link for you guys so you can see some of the photos that I'm uh, we're, we're going to be talking about. I'll post these into the, excuse me, into the, IRC chat room so you guys can follow along 
with uh, what I'm talking about, or what we're talking about. I'm going to cover up my wife's beautiful face while I, oops, show off some of these photos. Hang on a second. Let me escape out of this and then put this in her face. As you can see, a lot of people think or believe, rightfully or wrongly, that street photography needs to be in black and white. And that's quite often the case, if only because for a lot of street photography, a lot of it is uh, images of people. And for whatever reason, quite often people are more interesting in black and white than they are in color. Not always, but quite often they are. I always, whenever I, I shoot people, um, I will either go and shoot with the idea of shooting in black and white, in which case I can turn my camera into a black and white camera. By the way, you can do that too, whether you're using your iPhone or you're using your DSLR. Many DSLRs have the ability to let you shoot in black and white. So in your viewfinder, you're actually looking at a black and white image as opposed to shooting in color. And then in your photo editing app, changing it into black and white. Same with the iPhone. You can shoot with the iPhone using the filters, and you can shoot in black and white. And it's interesting because when you go out w with the express purpose of shooting in black and white, you look at the world in a different way. You're not looking for color. You actually have to block color out. As human beings, we are, we are naturally drawn, our eyes are naturally drawn to color and colorful things. And you kind of, if you're shooting intentionally for black and white, you got to kind of block that out. When you're shooting in black and white intentionally, you're looking for contrast, you're looking for texture, you're looking for shadow and light and the play of those two things on objects and on people's faces. So you can either shoot in black and white or you can take your photos, post-process them in black and white. There's no right way or wrong way to do it one way or, or the other. I think whenever I shoot people, if I shoot them in color, I, you know, I use Lightroom. I will always tap in the Lightroom black and white um, tab just to get a sense of what this image might look like in black and white. Just to get, Sometimes it works better that way. But obviously if I'm shooting intentionally with black and white, I, I'm obviously not going to do that. So some of these shots you can see that are on this uh, Google Photography Lisbon <clears throat> page that, that uh, Melissa found. Some of them are definitely in, in black and white images and, and look really, really interesting. Uh, I like some of them. Was there any here that you particularly liked, Oh, Melissa? I, I can't remember now. It was so it was a while ago that you, that I... This is one of those shots that you can get by staying in one place and pointing your camera at the... Um, Look at this. I just happened to click on a two-day Lisbon travel and street mm. photography workshop for 1,800 pounds for two days. Are you kidding me? Two days. That's ridiculous. I think there's one of him instructing there. Oh, where is it? The photographer. But this is the kind of shot that the photographer, um, I guarantee you, the photographer is standing in that one place, probably just standing there waiting, looking down that street, and sees this guy walking towards him and very patiently waits. You don't draw t the, I can tell by the look on the, the guy's face, the, the subject's face, he's probably either ignoring the photographer or hasn't seen the photographer. He's got no interest in the photographer, and that's okay. If that's what the photographer wants, if that's the the effect he wants to get. And if that being the case, then the photographer undoubtedly isn't pointing his camera at this guy. He's not standing there with the camera up to his eye waiting for this guy to come towards him. That looks too obvious. This is the kind of thing that we talked about on the show two weeks ago of you have your camera set already for all the settings that you need, whether that be... Your ISO is set properly. Your shutter speed is set properly. Your aperture, all that stuff is already preset, so that all you so all you have to do is pretty much your camera becomes a point and shoot. When he gets to that spot that you want, you lift your camera and click. You might not even have to lift your camera if you've got a wide angle <coughs> a wide angle lens. You can hold the camera at hip hip height or chest height and shoot the photo that way. 
I've told the story after my friend uh, Tony Rosario, who does that in New York City. He does all of his photography from the hip or from the chest. He takes some great, amazing images. So keep that in mind. You you don't necessarily you want to be ready for the shot before well before the shot actually happens. But I like I like the look on the, on, on the guy's face. One of the things I love doing, and this is a uh, an, an example of that, is this idea of catching reflections of people. In sorry, I didn't get this uh, lady. Where's that shot? Come on, I should have clicked right to the shot. Okay, I didn't. So you can see this image of this uh, this woman who is um, looking possibly wistfully off to the side while she uh, looks at this uh, through this window. Another example of, of where you are, as as the photographer, you are you've pre-focused on that spot on the window. You've already maybe taken a couple of test shots. And you're just waiting for someone to move into your frame. You're not being obvious. You're not standing with the camera pointing at that spot in the window. Because if you had been, this this lady wouldn't have walked into your shot. He, she wouldn't have gotten in the way. Um, you might have shot over her shoulder, waited for someone to walk into the shot, and then shot over her shoulder. One of my favorite shots was something similar to this here in downtown Vancouver. And I, I shot it in black and white. And there was this lady looking in the window of uh, the Salvatore Ferragamo store, the, the the beautiful shoe store in downtown Vancouver. And you could see she had one hand just looking at these shoes with the most, I could see a reflection in, the, in the, the, the glass with this most wistful look on her face. Like she really, really wanted to buy these shoes, but she knows she can't afford them. And she stood there for a good two or three minutes. It wasn't, this wasn't her walking by and going, oh, those are pretty, and continuing. She was staring at these shoes and I took this shot over her shoulder I didn't get her reflection in the glass like I wanted to but I did get the Salvatore Ferragamo sign I did get her the, her, the, her her facial expression I love that shot but it was because I had pre my camera was already set up for the for the street photography I had pre focused on that distance so I knew everything that was 10 to 15 feet away from me I'm so sorry. I was looking up a guy's street photography <laughs> course. Go on. So this is another example of, of when you're when you're doing street photography, you got to be prepared ahead of time. A lot of the it's it's you got to know your camera. You got to know what you want to shoot. You got to know this stuff ahead of time. You can't expect your subject in street photography to wait for you to take 15 test shots and dial in your settings. You have to know ahead of time. So you've got to know what you're going to shoot. You've got to know what, how you're going to shoot it well, well ahead of time. This is one of those shots where uh, I think this is really interesting because you can see that these are, are, are two tool and two old guys sitting on a bench is universal. <laughs> Everywhere in the world, you can find two old guys sitting on a bench. <laughs> it's the easiest shot in the world to get. But you can see this guy probably has just spotted the photographer. And I'd be interested to, to know what happened afterwards. Did the guy smile? Did he give them a dirty look? Why? Well, what would have happened afterwards? But right there in this shot, the photographer has caught them in that instance. And again, that's because he was ready. He, she was ready to take the shot. Their camera was set up to get this shot. They were looking for these kinds of shots. So preparation, preparation, preparation. I love the look on the guy's face. Just mm -hmm. these two old guys just, just sitting there. Mm -hmm. So these are all, all people shots. Another another example. These, by the way, these are all shots of, of sh shot in and around Lisbon. Mm -hmm. I, this is one of those ones where you want to ask the story of, the hell is going on here? <laughs> What if they made a human ladder to either get up into or look through uh, this window? <laughs> For me, I, 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 it doesn't look like it's real. It doesn't look yeah. like that, that, that you know, the people on the bottom can actually hold up in this position all these other people. But it's an interesting shot. <laughs> and it's one of those shots that isn't going to happen around, it, it, it isn't going to be around very long. You better take this shot right away. Oh, yes. This is not a shot that, that that's going to... Uh, to linger for for very long now here's a shot of a guy who 
obviously sees the photographer, knows he's having mm. his picture taken, and is probably okay with it. This feels like he's pretty up close to the photographer, or the or the. This is not a long lens. He's not zoomed in 200 millimeters or, or anything else like that. The photographer standing within probably four or five feet, if that, of this guy. Maybe he's asked permission. And asking permission is your choice as the photographer. It often depends on how brave is the wrong word, but I guess that's kind of the sense I'm, I'm thinking of. It's It's how... It's often a matter of, of how willing you are to be rejected and how willing you are to be rejected in ways that may be uncomfortable for you. I'm okay if somebody yells at me at the, on the street. Someone curses me. Don't take my picture. Blah, blah, blah. I'm okay with that because I'm a big guy. I've got no problem with that. But other people may not be so comfortable with that. And if you're not comfortable with that, then you can be a different kind of shooter. And that kind of shooter is someone who would ask permission. Excuse me, would you mind if I take your photo? Mm. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're going to do, I don't know if I've talked about this before on, on the show, in our photography workshop in Lisbon, we're going to have several days or we're going to be walking around together, you and I, Melissa, the, the gang. But we'll have one day of street photography focused on that or one morning of street photography. And... Monty says, yeah, but you're six foot two, not as easy to yell at you being intimidating. Exactly. I'm, I'm not worried about that. So we're going to have one day of uh, street photography. And on that day, you feel free to, first of all, I think being with a group, you'll be a little braver. But you'll also be able to ask me to ask them to take their picture. All you'll have to do is walk into me and go, hey, I think that, that per mm. person's got a really great face. Do you mind if you can, can we shoot them? And I'll say, not a problem. I'll walk up to them. I'll have my little translator. I'll first thing I'll say is, do you speak English? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and if they don't, then I'll have my little, my little Portuguese translator app that will say, we think you've got a great face. Would you mind if we take your picture? So I'll take that tension away from the shot for you. And like we did when we were on, on, on Granville street that day, taking pictures of, of the ladies in the, in the cool fascinator hats. I'll keep them, they'll be more likely to be comfortable having their picture taken if they're distracted. And so my job is going to be to try to distract the person. Not in Portuguese, but I'll try to find some way to to distract them from staring at you and you not have to worry about it. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time with any one person. So you, again, you're going to have to be ready to take the shots. We're not going to ask someone to, you know, would you mind standing here for five minutes while we dial in our settings on mm. our shots? We're going to want, going to go boom, 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 take two or three shots, say thank you and move on. I see there's a question in the chat room. No. Psst, hey, Melissa, get the ball. Go to ask those people who are apparently on their first date. If we can take their picture. <laughs> And I wouldn't have a problem with that. I, w I would not have a problem with that at all. If, if there was a, you know, the, well, there's a, there's a, uh, a shot here of uh, a couple. There they are, right here. You know, I think this is this is a really interesting shot with her looking away, the kids, the skater kids, <laughs> be, be in, in behind watching them. Um, it's a, it's an interesting photo. I wouldn't take this photo, but if this was an example of that, I would have no problem walking up to them going, Hey, would you guys mind if we took a couple pictures of you were, you know, a couple of, uh, photographers who want to take shots. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, she doesn't look like she wants to even get kissed and even getting her photo taken. I don't think so. Maybe, maybe not. I think you need to read the room personally. If you're a street photographer, you need to go, what's the feels here? Sure. And, um, you know, maybe you ask and maybe not. I'm always, I will always ask if I think the shot's so good that I'm going to want to be able to try to sell it. I will always ask that. But for shots like these, like this is a wonderful shot of the uh, streetcar tracks in um, Lisbon. There's a person in the shot, but because hmm. he's not the focus of the yes. shot. You wouldn't have to ask them. You wouldn't for have to permission. run up and ask him or anything. Um, we've talked a little bit about the rules of 
photography in in various places and in this situation you don't really have to if the person's face isn't recognizable Mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about taking their shot in public so if they have their back to you or their um it's a blurry reflection in a window or off the distance like that shot and it's not really a concern you really don't have to worry too much about it Macman says, for me, there's a personal line I know not to cross when shooting in public. Yeah, it's and, and that line may change depending on where you are. I've said before, I have this really weird thing about not being able to talk to people when I'm just by myself and shooting. I can't take portrait shots when I'm by myself. I don't feel comfortable mm-hmm. walking up to someone and saying, excuse me, would you mind if I take your picture? Because I think part of it is because I don't want to look like a creep. I don't want to look like some big, giant pervert want to take pictures but if i'm with somebody i can say hey we are shooting we are taking photos of people and would 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 you mind if i took your shot and i have no problem doing that no it's interesting that my my line is depends on who's with me how brave i am i guess and what i'm willing to do and what i'm willing to shoot Mm -hmm. um i will never shoot children without the parents permission no even though it's legal you still shouldn't. You just don't. Unless the kids are off in the distance. Mm. Or the they're... parents are there waving, yeah. going, oh, and then you take their picture and they're still fine with you taking their picture. And don't worry about the language barrier. The language barrier, we're going to be in, in, in Portugal. It's, it's Portuguese. Um, there are all kinds of apps out there that, that can help you. But for the most part, if you've got a camera, if you just sort of smile at the person, point to your camera and point to them, they'll tell you. They'll shake their head or they'll give you a little smile. And as soon as they smile, be ready to take the shot. Don't waste their time. Be ready to take the shot. Because the other thing is, depending on the kind of photographer you are, I don't want them to pose for me. I, I saw them in their natural state. I want to shoot them in their natural state. So I don't want someone to, to have enough time to get themselves together and give me a fake sort of smile. Mm. Well, that's the thing. Sometimes you don't want them to know. You might want to go up to them after and say, I took this photograph of you. Can I, can I, because you might not break, asking them could break a moment of getting a great shot. Yes, yes. That's always the, the, um, the tug and pull of street photography is if you ask, as Melissa said, you break the, 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 maybe you break the magic of that moment of the shot. That person was lost in thought or they were looking off, off, off in the distance. Or a beautiful laugh or something. Yeah, exactly. You just want to take them. Exactly. So there's, there's all kinds of different ways of doing this. Monty says, Sean, the day in Portland where you and I went to the Riverwalk area and shot, there was a cute kid playing with a dog in the fountain. I wouldn't have asked his adult if I could take his picture if I was by myself. Mm. But you and I together made it less creepy. I think that's, that's true. It, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it would be considered le- less creepy. Uh, Macman, when I was at that event where I saw the B-29 flying, there was a World War II vet who got choked up after the plane landed and was taxiing by to the display area. Mm. It would have made a great photo. I didn't feel right in taking it. Now, that's interesting. Well, that's because that's his emotion. That was his, he was in emotion. And so, I don't know, I think maybe people are uncomfortable being vulnerable like that. That's vulnerable. See, now, I think I would have taken the shot if I could have gotten the shot that I imagined in my head from MacMan's description. If I could have gotten a shot of him with his medals and his hat, sorry, his, his, yeah, his, his, his hat on, his medals and the full um, uniform type thing, with something, and this is the way I'm envisioning it in my head, with something in the background to let you know you were at a event, I might have taken the picture. Mm. Like there's an old plane in the background sort of thing. I might have taken that picture. Do you remember that beautiful Life magazine photograph of that African-American man at Martin Luther King's funeral. Just remember, Mm -hmm. and he was in his full uniform. I'm not quite sure. He was part of the band. Maybe he had, I think he was playing the accordion. Anyway, he was just crying. Do you remember that photograph? A powerful photograph. Very powerful. I'm loving all the shadows. That's the other thing about street photography. Yeah. Is it doesn't have to be people. Maybe you're not comfortable shooting people. Maybe you don't like to shoot people. You can also just look for um, other things, like like this this example of of the tracks. There's a bunch of shots that I've envisioned 
in Lisbon that that, that I want to take pictures of the um, the trams or the the world famous trams in in Lisbon the uh, the the tile work on the the ground here's a shot of one of the uh, this is the famous tram 28 which we will travel several times uh, in 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 Lisbon I love the 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 black and white play on this one of the light on the right hand side and the the streetcar, someone looking at you in, in, in the picture, but it's still more about the streetcar than it is about the the person in the picture. There's all kinds of great images of Lisbon that, that can be shot in color or black and white. And will really give you an interesting sense. I can't see myself personally doing a lot of stuff in black and white in Lisbon because to me, Lisbon seems like such a, a bright, vibrant kind of city that the pictures I've seen already of them, I don't know if I'd want to, I think wash it out is the wrong way to describe it, but to take pictures that don't show all the wonderful color of this beautiful city. So that's my, that's just me personally. That's the way I feel about it. But you know, certainly if you want to take a black and white shots, you are more than welcome to. We'll actually do a, a little bit of a class on how to shoot in black and white when we are in Lisbon. Let's give away a copy. Uh, we got a copy, one copy of uh, Clean My Mac 10 for, from the nice folks at MacPaw. And we got another another uh, travel guide, a travel guide of your choice. The, you know, not just Lisbon, but of any other place that you want to go. Thanks to the nice folks at Lonely Planet at LonelyPlanet.com. Let me just get my tickle trunk of subscribers' names or the people who have entered the contest. And I'm scrolling up and down and scrolling up and down. Stop. Oop. This is going to be for you choose. This, this is going to be for the. Um, I'm blocking, so I can't see who it is. For the um, software or the uh, guidebook. The software. Software. This is going to go out to Jonathan Jacobs. Jonathan, congratulations! You won a copy of Clean My Mac. X congratulations. From the nice folks at hmm. MacPaw. Thanks very much to the folks at MacPaw for letting us give away a copy of that. So, I've got that for Jonathan. Okay, now I'm going to scroll up and down. This is going to be for the travel guide. From Stop. the folks at Lonely Planet. It's going to go out to Richard Madison. Richard Madison is in Long Island, if I, if I remember correctly. Richard, congratulations. You've won congratulations. a travel guide. I know Richard will use this because he, he, he is a traveler. So. Mm. so Lonely Planet off to Richard. As always, it's easy to enter a contest. Just go to our website at yourmaclifeshow.com. Right there at the top of the page, it says Friends of YML Entry Form. You fill that entry form in with a valid email address, and I drop your name into our virtual hat, and we just draw names randomly whenever we feel like it to give stuff away. Or you can subscribe to Your Mac Life at 2 5 10 15 bucks a month, whatever you so choose. And you and then I will enter, enter your name into the draw automatically if you – don't subscribe. You have to go to the website each and every month, beginning of the month, middle of the month, whenever, and do your entry form. But if you subscribe, I do it for you. It's one of the services we offer here at Your Mac Life for subscribers. Uh, and uh, for every $2 above the initial $2 subscription, you get an extra entry form. So if you subscribe for $4 a month, you get two entry forms and so on and so forth. It's easy to do. Just go to... Uh, the website, yourmaclifeshow.com, on the right hand, left hand side, you can see the uh, entry form, sorry, the subscription form there. And also below that are Amazon.com links. Uh, the Christmas season is coming upon us. I know, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And many of you will be shopping on Amazon.com. And if you choose one of the things that I've got listed there on the left hand side of the page from Amazon.com, we get a bit of a kickback from Amazon. It's not a whole lot, but you know, every little bit helps. So if you're going to go to go shopping on Amazon.com, we'd appreciate it if you came to our site first and uh, just clicked on one of our links. You don't have to buy that thing that uh, you clicked on, uh, but anything that you um, purchase in that session will also give us a bit of a. If, if you buy that thing, you get we get more money. But anything you buy during that session, we also get a small kickback from that too. The um, the first thing I've got in the list there, I don't know if anyone's even noticed this, um, is this little interesting uh, 
fast charge Q charger. I'm going to put this up and I'm going to, again, sorry, Melissa, I'm going to block your face. Wireless charger, fast wireless charging pad for Samsung. Blah, 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 blah. It was uh, uh, 10 bucks, I think. And uh, a quick quick little review. It's a it's a cheap, flimsy, plasticky thing. It's 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 not. I wouldn't want to drop it anywhere. Um, I'm surprised how well this works. It works perfectly fine with my iPhone 10 with a cover on it, with one of the Apple Apple covers on it, and it also works in the portrait orientation. And surprisingly enough to me, landscape as well. So it'll charge while it's in landscape mode. So if you're like watching a video, it will also charge while it watches the video. It will also work upside down, which is also kind of cool. Hmm. Um, the charging isn't fast. Wireless charging is, is not fast charging, but it's sitting here in front of me during the day. So when I sit down at the computer, I just drop this onto it. And because it is in a stand kind of thing, I can also see it. So it's charging, and I can see the screen perfectly well. So if I get tweets or iMessages from Melissa or notifications or phone calls, I can see the screen very easily on this, which is which is kind of nice. The biggest downside is the there's a little you can't see it in the video, but there's a charging light there, which is great, it lets you know when it's on, and then it lets you know when it's charging. But like a lot of companies, these charging lights are unnecessarily bright. I can't. I have to cover that light. If this was about we, when we were in um, Vancouver last week, I took this with me to charge my iPhone up. And I had it on the bedside table. I was using the phone as an alarm clock. And I had to block the the light from the bottom of it because it was so freaking bright that it was annoying. So that's a downside. I don't worry about it now because it's here in front of my computer, so the brightness doesn't doesn't bother me. Like I said, it is cheap and flimsy. You know, it's just plasticky stuff. But um, it works. And for ten bucks, what the hell? I, I was willing to take a take a flyer on this thing for ten bucks. So if it's it's called the uh, the fast wireless charger. There's all kinds of them out there nowadays. Um, it all kinds of different price ranges. That's why I wanted to get a cheap one just to see see if it worked. And like I said, I was surprised that it worked through the case. I didn't have to take the case off of my iPad. So that's pretty cool. Hmm. Uh, are there any emails? Let's see if I can get any emails. Uh, Don Beck in um, donbeck.org. My favorite Halloween trick-or-treat story. Shortly after my first wife and I separated, she asked me to come over and man the door to give out treats while she took our kids out to the neighborhood houses. That's nice of you to do that. Mm. Uh, she had she had left me with a b big bowl of candy and a big bowl of apples. Apples were from the Pick It Yourself Orchard down the street, mm. where she frequently helped the man help man the store. One time the doorbell rang. It was the woman who owned the orchard and her two kids. Her youngest helped himself to a piece of candy or two, and the daughter took an apple. She, she the mom, said, Margie, why an apple? We planted them at home. But Margie was in the mood for an apple. <laughs> I found this fairly amusing. But the best part came a few days later. My ex told me that she had spoken to the woman from the orchard and that when they got home, Margie cut open the apple, like she'd been told to in school, to make sure there were no razor blades. The woman once again said to her daughter, Margie, what are you doing? The apple came from our orchard, and we know Mrs. Beck. To which Margie answered, what about Mr. Beck? <laughs> oh, my God. We, we don't I know him. Know. Uh, <laughs> mm, uh, exactly. Mr. Beck. <laughs> Mr. Beck's a little shady. Good for her. She's <laughs> listening and following through. How awful. No kidding. Cut open your apples. Terry Sugar says, uh, Sean, I was cringing. During the beginning of the show, when you were calling the new iPhones, iPhone models X, whatever, XS, X Max, XR. Then you called your current phone a 10 with no difficulty. <laughs> Glad you got spanked for your transgression from IRC, or I would be spanking you now. Oh, I guess I just did. Love your show. S for HD, I listen to the audio only and get a surprising amount of value from the photography segments with no visuals at all. I visualize it. Interesting. Do what you want, Terry says. Maybe just upload high-res images of the photos to supplement the podcast. Thanks, Terry, for your opinion. I appreciate that. That's it for tonight's show, folks. Thank you guys very much for joining us here this win. Monty noticed that, too, that you did that. You're going, X, 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 and then you went, my iPhone 10. So. I hate that they use the letter X. 
It's always annoyed me. Mac OS X, iPhone X, it, it just stop it. I, stop it. I think it goes back to my days of having to do algebra in high school and hating the letter X. You know, oh. solve for X. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. To this day, that I hate the letter X. X. So maybe, maybe that's what it is. Uh, folks, as always, thank you guys very much for joining us. Thanks to uh, Jim Dalmer from The Loop at loopinsight.com for being here. Uh, send us emails during the week to sean at com. If you want more information about our starting point photography in Lisbon workshop, uh, please send us emails to sean at com or go to the website at startingpointphotography.com or follow me on Facebook and you'll get more information there. That's it. I've been Sean King. I'm Melissa King. And you've been listening to your Mac Life. See ya. Bye.